the unexpected. It was the hour before the gods awake. The calendar stood at November 1938, the month of the Dushan. A few weeks more and we would meet the master after a long wait of three months. After every Dushan we start counting the days for the next one, for each occasion brings the Eternal and his Shakti closer to us and is therefore a significant landmark in our lives. As the date comes nearer, our days too take on a brighter hue and the day before the Dushan, all faces glow with sway at smiles. Friends meeting on the road greet each other with one word, tomorrow. Or with a silent look of happy expectation. The dining room hums with the same theme. Wherever you go, whomsoever you meet, no other talk except the Guru's Dushan for one or two minutes, an eternal moment. As for myself, my feelings are more complex. I have broken verbal lances with him, challenged his views, poked fun at his yoga. I know all these will be forgotten at the moment when I shall meet his august presence. He will be as affable as in his letters and bestow his gracious smile from his transcendental height while my heart will beat in joy and wonder. Still, the mind cannot be entirely free from a conventional fear. In this mood of expectation we arrived at the eve of the Dushan, November 24. The mother gave her blessings to all in the morning. Embodiment of the Mahalakshmi grace and beauty, she poured her smile and filled our hearts with love and adoration, an ideal condition in which to present ourselves to the Lord. Each Dushan is an occasion for him to survey the progress we have made after the last one and to give us a fresh push towards a further advance. Visitors had swollen the even flow of our life, among them, Miss Wilson, daughter of President Wilson, had come from far off America for the Master's Dushan. His book essays on the Gita had cast an unearthly spell upon her. That there could be someone who could write such a wonderful book in this materialistic age was beyond her imagination. She could h hear the voice of the Lord saying to man, Abandon all dermas. Take refuge in meal one. I shall deliver thee from all sin. The book was her Bible. She decided she must have the dushan of such a unique person. The day passed in a happy rhythm. Most of the sardaks had gone to bed early to prepare inwardly for the great event. Over the ashram reigned an atmosphere of deep peace and silence. Only one light was burning in Sri Aurobindo's corner room towards the street and keeping a vigil over the pervasive darkness. The mother too had retired early, leaving Sri Aurobindo at his work. He was perhaps busy with Savitri now that the avalanche of correspondence had been arrested due to Dushan work. Thus the small hours were reached. Then in Purani's room the light was switched on, it was 2 a.m. He had to prepare hot water for the mother's bath. At 7.30 a.m. The Dushan would start. But nobody suspected that. Across the path of the divine event. The huge foreboding mind of night, alone in her unlit temple of eternity, lay stretched immobile upon silence marge. Breaking the profound silence the emergency bell rang from the mother's room. Pirani rushed up and found the mother at the top of the staircase. She said, Sri Aurobindo has fallen down. Go and fetch Dr. Manilal. Fortunately, he had come for the Dushan from Gujarat. Soon he arrived and saw that Sri Aurobindo was lying on the floor in his bedroom. On his way to the bathroom he had stumbled over a tiger skin. The doctor made a preliminary examination and suspected a fracture of the right thigh bone. He asked the mother to send for assistance. It appears that Sri Aurobindo while passing from his sitting room to the bathroom, probably revolving some lines of savagery, fell with his right knee striking the head of a tiger. Perhaps there was jubilation among the adverse forces crying, Our enemy has fallen. Sri Aurobindo, however, remained unperturbed and tried to get up. Failing to do so he lay down quietly expecting that the mother would come in soon. As was natural, the mother in her turn received a strong vibration in her sleep which made her feel that. Something had gone wrong with Sri Aurobindo. She came in immediately and 
found him lying on the floor. Her intuition and good general knowledge of medical science made her suspect a fracture. She rang the emergency bell. When we other doctors came up, we saw Dr. Manila examining Sri Aurobindo's injured leg. The mother was sitting by Sri Aurobindo aside, fanning him gently. I could not believe what I saw, on the one hand Sri Aurobindo lying helplessly, on the other, a deep divine sorrow on the mother's face. But I soon regained my composure and helped the doctor in the examination. My medical I could not help taking in at a glance Sri Aurobindo's entire body and appreciating the robust manly frame. His right knee was flexed, his face bore a perplexed smile as if he did not know what was wrong with him, the chest was bare, well developed and the finely pressed snow white doty drawn up contrasted with the shining golden thighs, round and marble smooth, reminiscent of Yeats's line, world famous golden thighed Pythagoras. A sudden fugitive vision of the golden Purusha of the Vedas. Each gentle movement of the leg by the doctor made Sri Aurobindo let out a short R. Ah, which prompted the mother to ask, Is it hurting you? Throughout the investigation, he uttered very few words, only to answer the doctor's questions. Finally, the doctor pronounced that there was a fracture of the thigh bone. Sri Aurobindo simply heard the verdict and made no comment. A team of attendants was formed consisting of Dr. Manilal, three other medical men, Champaklau, Sri Aurobindo's personal attendant, and Purani, who had acquired the right by his past association with Sri Aurobindo to be included. One more hand was still needed. The mother simply looked through the window shutters of Sri Aurobindo's room and seeing Dr. Satyendra below chatting in front of his dental clinic said, Take Satyendra. A happy choice. A strong man with a genial bearing. The next step was to plaster the leg. Dr. Ayo, a friend of the Sardak Jurezwami and superintendent of Kudalore Hospital, was sent for, since the local hospital might not have been able to give us the necessary equipment. Purani brought the plaster of Paris from the government pharmacy. At last the injured leg was put in a cast as a first aid. The next move was to take the Lord to his bed. We found it quite a job to carry him in spite of our having three muscular figures amongst us, Purani, C.H. Ampaklal and Satyendra. His physical frame had considerable weight like the spiritual substance it enshrined. Already two hours had passed and the news had flown all over the ashram. A real bolt from the blue. All hopes and aspirations of hundreds of P.O. plea were set at naught by this single blow. They gathered in the courtyard of the ashram to know the truth and went back sullen-hearted with a fervent prayer addressed to the mother and the Lord for his speedy recovery. Miss Wilson accepted fate's decree with a calm submission. The mother, out of compassion for the disappointed devotees, gave Dushan to all in the evening. Thus she wiped away their gloom with the sunshine of her smile and the power of her touch. As we had no work now except to keep a watch, I could not but contemplate upon what had happened. I remembered Sri Aurobindo writing to me that though he had acquired sufficient control over disease and death, accidents were possible. Still, living in entire seclusion, secure from all outward contingencies, and inwardly master of cosmic forces, and yet to meet with such an accident in so unexpected a way, was inconceivable. Sri Aurobindo explained to us later on in the talks the why and wherefore of the catastrophe. The forces must have been very slight clever indeed to have chosen the time when the mother had retired, the gods were asleep. But the powers of the unconscious were awake to strike their infernal blow. It was really the hour of the unexpected, in the clear morning light I could have a good view of Sri Aurobindo as he was lying on his bed, almost motionless and straight. I asked myself, is he enjoying a bit of sweet sleep since he had none the whole night? Or is he simply keeping quiet and bearing the severe pain with equanimity? It was the latter, as he told us afterwards. Only the mother's visit, to make some inquiries or to offer some drink, showed flickers of life in his otherwise trance-like mood. I could now observe him from close at hand and the room he had been living in for the last twelve years. 
Since then, it has undergone such a tremendous change that just a faint memory of its original state is all that remains today. The wooden bed, on which Sri Aurobindo was lying, was rather large, the upper part being slightly raised, and he filled almost the entire breadth, the broad chest and the head large and round, the fine silken hair parted in the middle. As for the rest of the room, it was very plain, almost austerely furnished, except for the carpet, one small box with table at either end of the room, a semicircular table in the middle, notebooks, and odds and ends of papers lying scattered on one of the tables, a big Almer containing a small number of books, on the top shelf, the bound volumes of the Arya. On the next one, the collected works of Shakespeare and Shelley and books presented by writers such as Radhakrishnan, James Cousins, etc. There were two paintings, one Chinese and the other of Amitta per Buddha with the lotus in his hand, a few wood carvings, a couch for the mother opposite Sri Aurobindo's bed. The only furniture of luxury was a long cane chair in the adjacent room, in which he could recline and have some repose. When Dr. Manila arrived after his breakfast, he asked Sri Aurobindo how he felt. There was no complaint and the answer was brief. Soon after, Dr. Ayo arrived. On hearing the story of the fall he proposed that an orthopedic surgeon from Madras be called for consultation. He had a friend Dr. Norasimha Ayer, well known for his efficiency. The mother AP proved and he left for Madras. We now had nothing else to do except wait. The day rolled on. We were counting hours and minutes for DR. Ayo's return. Any sound of a car horn would make us run to the window. Pondicherry in 1938 was, by the way, far from what it is today. The number of cars could almost be counted and they drove by at long intervals, so we could easily be deceived by the sound of a horn, particularly in our anxious anticipation. Dr. Manila would give us fatherly admonition not to be so restless, both his age and experience must have taught him some samat and an objective outlook on things. Meanwhile, Sri Aurobindo, the divine patient, was lying quietly in his spacious bed, apparently quite at ease. To Dr. Manila's occasional inquiries he gave monosyllabic answers, and the rest of us were perhaps no thing more than shadowy forms moving about, having no names and awaking no interest. Only when the mother came from time to time and asked with a sweet smile, is it paining you? We saw some difference on an otherwise impassive face. At last after many deceptions, we were informed that the doctors had arrived. It was evening. They explained that they were delayed because they wanted an expert radiologist friend to accompany them, and when he was hunted down in the labyrinthine Madras metropolis, the radiologist agreed to follow soon. The room was now astir. The plaster cast was removed and the specialist examined the limb. He confirmed the diagnosis of fracture but would wait for x-ray pictures before he started any manipulation. The mother put many intricate questions to him on various possibilities, the prognosis, lines of treatment, etc., etc., and the specialist wondered with admiration at her possession of so much technical knowledge. Sri Aurobindo, on the other hand, sitting up in bed, listened witness-like, yet intently, to all the talk, looking from one face to another, but uttered not a single word. The mother was explaining to him the surgeon's opinion as if he could not grasp all that was happening. He left the bargaining to the mother, and accepted whatever she decided for him. She was certainly the better judge. I was very much intrigued by this passive role. One who had been sending me sound medical advice about patients had not a word to say about himself on such a crucial matter. Spectator-like and amused, he simply sat, a big child, his face and eyes beaming with a smile, and the body glowing with an angelic radiance. The radiologist arrived with his X-ray machine at about 11 p.m. and stirred us into action. He was quite a smart young man carrying a confident air and went about his business in a formal manner. He took a few films and developed them at once which was a great relief to us. But the diagnosis came like a stunning blow. 
The mother was shown the pictures revealing an impacted fracture of the right femur above the knee, two fragments firmly locked together. Both the specialist and the radiologist took a serious view of it, and remarked that if the fragments had projected backwards, the main blood vessels and nerves running behind the bone would have ruptured and caused a big disaster. It would have been most unwise in this situation to reduce the fracture by any forceful traction or other drastic mechanical contrivance. I would leave it alone, put the limb in plaster, and by means of the splints exert a steady traction, was the final verdict of the specialist. The advice was accepted and the limb put into traction from the end of the bed. Particular attention was to be paid to the daily passive movements of the patella in order to avoid adhesion. The patient was to stay in bed for a number of weeks and the specialist would pay a second visit later on to consider the future course. The other doctors now took their leave and Dr. Manilo resumed the charge of the patient. The x-ray plates were kept in Sri Aurobindo's room for a number of years. One day the mother said, remove them from here. I kept them in my personal custody, but could not trace them afterwards. One thing I could not fail to notice was that from the moment of the fal L to the doctor's departure, Sri Aurobindo remained most unusually calm and unperturbed as if nothing had happened to him. No questions about his condition, no anxiety, no complaint of any sort, quiet acceptance of the doctor's direction. It is this submission that made Dr. Ayo remark afterwards that Sri Aurobindo was an ideal patient. With the same submission he had accepted Lele's instruction to reject all thoughts. We know however that he was not always submissive in other fields of life. The following day, Dr. Manilo had to face from the mother such an unexpected thundering assault that we felt our hearts would stop with fear and consternation. It was Mahakali's wrath. I have never since seen her in such a fiery mood. Sri Aurobindo was lying quietly, the mother came into the room and, standing by his bed, asked Dr. Manilo what he thought of the fracture. The doctor either purposely gave an evasive reply with some hesitation or did not consider the case serious. The mother exploded, don't hide it. We know the truth, then I saw something rare that I shall never forget. The mother prostrated herself on the floor before Sri Aurobindo and, I believe, began to pray to him. From this supplication I could realize the gravity of the situation. Yet, she had shown no trace of it until then. Calm and solemn, Sri Aurobindo heard the silent prayer. Our working hours as attendants were divided according to individual preference. Purani chose the oddest hour of twelve midnight, but most convenient for the rest of us. As for the work, there was, to begin with, very little to do since Sri Aurobindo was to remain flat on his back in bed, without making any movement. Only someone had always to be near at hand in case he needed anything. The attendance by the entire team was required only at particular times, if, for instance, the body needed some adjustment after a long stay in one position. He who had had the mother as the sole companion, and Champa Klal as the only attendant, now had to admit others into his sanctum. Circumstances broke down the barriers of solitude and forced upon him a new pattern of life. Little by little the air of unfamiliarity gave way as Sri Aurobindo began to take cognizance of the new situation and the new conditions that were around him. Our awe also diminished gradually, dr. Manilal was helpful in this matter because he had attended the Maharaja and knew the ways of great men. Here too he combined very well his unobtrusive medical personality and simple devotional fervor. None felt like leaving the presence even for meals, though there was hardly anything to do. There must have been pain and discomfort owing to the unaccustomed posture but Sri Aurobindo would scarcely disturb anybody and would not call for any assistance. Only once I remember the doctor had to be called at night for some gnawing pain. The days began to take on a more and more rosy tint as the master became more and more communicative. The mother had a wheeled dinner table made for Sri Aurobindo, so he could take his meals sitting up in bed. She would lay the table herself, push it to the bed and serve the meals with her own hands. 
One day, not knowing the mother's ways, we rushed forward to help her push the table. With a sweet smile she complained to Sri Aurobindo, Oh, they are taking away my work. Much abashed, quickly we drew back and learnt the lesson that one must not be too forward. At first Sri Aurobindo took three meals a day, the morning one being quite light. Champaklal and I used to be present at this time. One day wishing to give me something, the mother asked me, Do you like bananas? I answered promptly, I don't dislike them, mother. The mother and Sri Aurobindo smiled but she refrained from giving them to me. That was my first joke with the mother. The morning meal however was stopped very soon, since it was too early for his appetite. Here I must mention a minor but interesting episode about tea. It was a well-known fact that Sri Aurobindo was fond of a daily cup of tea. The accident had upset that long-standing habit. Now the question was taken up. Dr. Manilal proposed that Sri Aurobindo should take a cup off Marmite during the day as well as tea. Sri Aurobindo would not take both. I do not remember whether he took Marmite at all, but I distinctly remember that he was taking tea. I also had a personal reason for this recollection, for I was, and even now am, a lover of tea, if not a mild addict. But Sri Aurobindo's way of drinking tea was rather odd, he had to drink it from a feeding cup. Could anyone relish a fine beverage taken out of a feeding cup, I wondered. Before the accident whenever we heard the tinkling sound of his spoon at midnight from his corner room, we used to say, Sri Aurobindo is having tea. One day he suddenly declared, I won't take tea any more. Thus a lifelong habit was given up in an instant. This incident recalls another which took place many years earlier. It concerns his early habit of smoking cigars. A cigar was almost always between his lips. Once Dev Das Gandhi, son of Mahatma Gandhi, visited him and saw the inevitable cigar. He shot the question, why are you attached to smoking? At once came the retort, why are you so attached to non-smoking? This gives us a hint that Sri Aurobindo smoked, but without any real attachment and the proof came a few years later when the mother began to take charge of household affairs and smoking was indulged in by all the inmates. She favoured non-smoking. Without the slightest hesitation Sri Aurobindo put aside his cigar. There was an end to an inveterate habit without the least fuss. To resume our story. When everything had settled down and our work had fallen into a regular pattern, the famous talk started, in the evening. At the beginning Sri Aurobindo, lying on his back, used to speak in a low voice to the group crowded near the bed. Naturally on that occasion all of us, except Pirani who stood at a distance, would rally round to listen to his finely cadenced voice and his utterances on various topics made in an intimate tone. He would rarely look at anybody while talking. The food question easily solved, next came the problem of the bath. We were left no other choice but to give a daily sponge bath so long as Sri Aurobindo was confined to bed. But even long afterwards, it continued for lack of a proper bathroom. Whatever the arrangement was, Sri Aurobindo was not affected in the least. It was Dr. Manilal's unique privilege to touch the divine body and give it a human cleansing with soap, powder, etc. Another thing that required medical attention was the proper functioning of the bowels. Their habit was deranged, and a constant flat position added to the difficulty. Various medical remedies were proposed, all of which were vetoed. Here Sri Aurobindo was more positive. He explained that he had not been accustomed to taking any medical accessories for years and years, all his ailments he had cured by the application of spiritual force. We argued that trifle, for instance, could hardly be called a medicine, it was a compound made of three fruits. Since the argument did not work, we asked, why not apply the force then? Well, he replied, not that I am not doing it but the body is not accustomed to receive the force in this position. He added with a smile, it is a tamasic position, and I feel too lazy to apply the force. 
We all laughed to hear this candid admission. Soon however the body did learn to respond, and there was no further trouble on that score. Of course, there were fluctuations and he used to remark, it is like the story of helping too much or too little. When we failed to grasp the illusion, he explained it at length. The story goes like this, during the Boer War two soldiers were running away on horseback. One of them was somewhat short and plump. He fell down from the horse. Finding it difficult to mount up, and the enemies hotly pursuing, he made a prayer, Oh God, help me to my saddle, and gave a big jump. He fell not on the saddle, but on the other side, and was caught. He exclaimed, Thou hast helped me too much. Since then the joke has become proverbial among us. One minor trouble that worried us was the early appearance of bed sores. They took some time to heal and it needed rubber cushions to protect the back from further damage. Sri Aurobindo inquired daily about the Kondite on. From then on, he started taking an active interest in his health in every detail. It will be seen from the above account that a personal relation had now grown between the Guru and the disciples, the sense of awe and distance had vanished. In this respect, Dr. Manilal must be considered our vanguard. His age, profession, charming childlike nature melted the apparently frosty reserve of the master. The divine has a soft corner for the healers of the body. The much-abused human representative of the divine healer has still a place in the economy of things. Nevertheless, even in his personal relations, Sri Aurobindo never lost his impersonality, now, as far as I was concerned, I was face to face with a disquieting situation. Dr. Manilal was to depart. He had come on a short leave for the Dushan and had made quite a long stay. He could not further extend his holidays, nor was it necessary, he said. For everything was running well, according to schedule, the critical period had been tidied over. We had only to follow the present regime almost blindfold, and there would be no trouble that he could foresee. Besides, Sri Aurobindo's force was there constantly at our call. The doctor assured us that he would come again when the limb was released from the plaster. But I could not be so easily persuaded. I was most reluctant to take the divine burden on my shoulders, frail as they were, and poor as I was in knowledge, strength and experience. True, things appear simple enough in the presence of a superior authority, but troubles gather as soon as he turns his back, for the adverse forces try to test, as it were, the novice, the uninitiated. So I clung to him like a child and entreated him not to leave me in midstream. The mother also pleaded on my behalf with the result that he stayed for a few days more. Sri Aurobindo was witnessing the scene silently. Then, after cheering me up, Dr. Manilal left to resume his post and to look after his family who felt helpless without him and were pressing him to come back. My dark forebodings were however set at rest by the grace that always helps one who relies upon its power, and there was no cause for anxiety. The divine took good care of himself. Only once as I was taking an afternoon nap did a call come down. When I ran up, Sri Aurobindo said with an almost apologetic smile, Oh, it is nothing much. The knee has been paining for some time, perhaps the position has got disturbed. I tried to set it right, it wouldn't work. But fortunately some readjustment of the slings put the matter right and I heaved a sigh of relief when he said, it is all right now. But the pain could not have been nothing much, for he would not have troubled me for a trivial discomfort. Things were moving quite well. No more shadows to overcast our days. We were as merry and buoyant as the spring, our faces shining and hearts singing in the bliss of the divine company and laughing with the delightful humour of the evening talks. We were now looking forward to the day when the splints would be removed. People started asking if there was any chance of a dushan in February. They would sorely miss it. The specialist had advised, because of the seriousness of the case and the advanced age of the patient, to keep the plaster on for ten weeks. Dr. 
IAO, on the other hand wanted for the same reasons, to cut the period to six weeks, for, he said, firm bony union must have already taken place and the very age of the patient should militate against a long static condition in bed, as bed sores and congestion of the lungs might set in. In fact, these had appeared and cleared up. So a comedy ensued on the proverbial difference between doctors. Dr. Ayo visited us frequently and insisted every time that these splints be removed. It pained him, he said, to see the master being confined unnecessarily for such a long wearisome period, and he said he had raised the matter with the specialist but they agreed to differ. He quoted his own hospital experiences in his favor. Though ten weeks was too long a period, none of us were willing to take the risk. What risk is there? He argued. Besides, Sri Aurobindo is an extraordinary patient, we can expect him to take good care of himself. As a result of his repeated insistence, the mother at last asked Sri Aurobindo to adjudicate. He replied, if I am an extraordinary patient, I must take extraordinary precaution too. The forces are quite active. I can't trust that I won't make some awkward movement in sleep. Between ten weeks and six, let us come to a compromise and put it to eight weeks. Dr. Io was apparently satisfied. Doctor's differ became henceforth a savoury jibe. In view of the complications that followed later on I am inclined to believe that Dr. Io was right in his opinion, but his rather ebullient personality failed to carry weight. There was another unexpected visitor. Dr. Savor, principal of a college in the south, and an amateur homeopath. I do not know how he gained entry into the sanctuary. Since homeopathy claimed to have some good remedies for hastening bony union, he was perhaps given a chance with the mother's consent. But there was no way of ascertaining the effect of the treatment. It did no harm, I suppose. Satyendra reminded me that at Dr. Savor's suggestion, a homeopathic drug Nux Vomica X had been TRI'd for Sri Aurobindo's constipation at the beginning. That having failed a higher potency 200 of the same drug was given and it produced a good effect. Dr. Manila wanted me to keep him informed of Sri Aurobindo's condition and, as if to be quite assured, put even the mother's seal upon it. The seal however could not affect my habitual indolence, and this was further encouraged, because everything was proceeding in a I smooth manner. The mother inquired once, perhaps on Dr. Manilal's complaint about my silence, then she referred my dilatoriness to Sri Aurobindo and I had to write without delay. In addition to my medical work, I had to do some intellectual work as well. Reading aloud the daily newspapers to Sri Aurobindo was one. The Hindu naturally was the paper of choice. His way of reading which I had to follow at first amused me, but I realized that most of us also read in a similar way. His remarks were quite enjoyable. He would say, read out the prominent headlines. As I read them aloud successively, he would ask, yes, what does it say? Let us hear. Or, that doesn't matter. Anything else? Thus in ten or fifteen minutes all the news was served out. The editorial had an occasional interest. One other paper that caught his fancy was the Daily Mail for its curly wee cartoon. He kept his interest in it till the end though he found it getting stale and dry. In the evening, the weekly New Statesman and Nation, sometimes the Manchester Guardian, used to be read by Purani, later on it came to be my job, but it stopped after a while. It was probably through these media that he maintained his contact with the details of the fast-changing movements in the political and cultural world, whose general aspects he could be inwardly aware of by his universalized yogic consciousness. The recovery. December and January had rolled on smoothly. We were now looking forward to the removal of the splints. Dr. Io on his weekly visits was pressing his case for the removal and was laughed at by all of us till he promised not to raise the issue again, only to break his word the next time. About the first week of February, some disquieting symptoms appeared. 
There was pain in the knee joint and a mild swelling of the leg. We were very much perturbed by this unexpected intrusion. The specialist, informed about it, replied that such minor complications were not rare in fracture cases and would soon clear up. Now Io got his chance, he argued that the unduly long immobilization had caused the symptoms and urged the removal of the splint ES. Poor doctor. Nobody listened to his lonely voice. We all clung to the authority of the specialist and waited for his second visit. But Pondicherry to Madras was then no flying motor drive. We had no cars, buses still belonged to the dreamland and the train service was as slow as it is today. I do not remember exactly when the specialist came and removed the splints, probably in the third or fourth week of February. As soon as it was done, the entire limb from the thigh downwards swelled up to our deep consternation. The thigh looked frightful, almost double its size. The mother kept an ominous silence, but Sri Aurobindo was as unconcerned as ever. The specialist repeated his view that such complications do set in in some cases, so we need not worry. The edema was of no consequence and would gradually subside. He was satisfied that a firm union of the bone had taken place. With proper and careful treatment, massage, compress, gradual walking, etc., the leg would return to its normal size. The mother was not however so easily satisfied. She questioned him very closely on the cause of the edema, its pathology, complications and danger, or other possible sequels. When the specialist stated that sometimes movements might dislodge a venous clot and bring about serious complications, the mother caught him at once and asked how then could he recommend massage and passive movements. The doctor was not prepared for such an astute question from a woman and said that the mother was a very intelligent person. We reported this remark to Sri Aurobindo, he simply smiled, all of us were very much depressed by this adverse manifestation, since it would delay his recovery. I was particularly disturbed and worried for I had not met with such a situation before and had to face it all alone, as a doctor. I needed much strength and faith. So far it was Sri Aurobindo who had been giving me his constant spiritual support in my medical work. Now the divine physician himself was the patient. Whom should I approach for help? Though I did not openly ask him to cure himself using my poor self as the physical instrument, as I did in my other medical cases, still with the conviction that his and the mother's force would be there, I proceeded with the instructions left by the specialist. But I was not free from anxiety. Meanwhile, I wrote to Dr. Manila about the complication, asking him to come down and bring with him two or three pairs of crutches from Bombay. Then there was the right foot that drew our attention. It had shrunk and shriveled up, due to impeded circulation and inactivity, to almost half its size. The skin of the sole had become dry like parchment. The mother brought some fine white cream and asked me to apply it. Sri Aurobindo sat up, his right leg extended and the mother stood by, watching the application. Her presence affected my self-confidence and I began the work rather clumsily. No, no, not that way. She cried out. Her protest put me at once on to the correct method. Then she smiled and said, yes, that's right. Sri Aurobindo, as usual, was enjoying the scene. The whole layer of skin of the soul, thin, candle white, peeled off like a cast. How small and tender looked the foot. He has written of his inner fight saying, my gaping wounds are a thousand and one, in his poem A God's Labor. Here was an outer wound added to his physical being. Still, no complaint. War is war. His hair also caused some trouble, for it was in a terribly tangled intrinsicate mess due to its prolonged fixed position and network as complicated as its definition by Dr. Johnson. How to untangle it? I do not know what made us bold enough to tackle that feminine problem instead of placing it in the mother's proper care. We had no idea then that she would be only too glad to do the job neither did she offer to do it. And Sri Aurobindo, of course, kept quiet. 
It is we who must ask, must open. It took us about an hour's desperate and delicate handling to disentangle that conglomerate. Skein like Lord Shiver's matted locks and bring all into a decent order. Sri Aurobindo accepted this torture with his usual submission. At the end of the perpetration, he simply asked, Have you left some hair? We laughed. True, this was meant as a joke, but he was not indifferent to physical grace and beauty. Later on when the mother took up his toilet and attended to his hair, after each combing, tufts of the precious glossy hair, were loosened off, an enriched Champa Klaus treasury. Sri Aurobindo on being informed of this loss, did something to stop the falling, until the end the hair retained its glistening abundance. When Dr. Manila arrived, I breathed a sigh of relief. He was not very happy to see the new development, but hoped that everything would be all right. He was confronted with three problems, the swelling, educating the patient to walk and the bending of the knee, all of which he dealt with in his characteristic efficient manner. The swelling according to him would subside in due course. Gentle massage and hot and cold compress continued, followed later by hot douche. We used to note its diminution week by week. But it took some months to disappear completely. The bending of the knee would also take some time in view of the adhesion of the patella to the underlying tissues, in spite of passive movements. The re-education in walking seemed to be rather a straightforward job, though it was the most awkward and difficult one, for Sri Aurobindo had to walk with crutches. All that was needed was a patient and persistent effort. For Sri Aurobindo's nature, unaccustomed to physical or mechanical contrivances, and the narrow space in the room made the venture somewhat risky. The first day he got up to use the crutches was a memorable one for us. In the presence of the mother we made him stand up, handed him the crutches and showed him how to use them. He fumbled and remarked, yes, it is easy to say. Two or three different pairs were tried out, but as he could not handle them properly, the mother proposed that he had better walk leaning on two persons, one on either side. It was certainly a bright suggestion, for Sri Aurobindo walking on crutches would have reminded us of his own phrase about Hephaestus' lame omnipotent motion. An insult to his shining majestic figure. Purani and Satyendra were selec ted by Dr. Manilal as his human supports, much less incongruous than the ungainly wooden instruments. That was how the re-education started. The paradox of the divine seeking frail human aid gave food to my sense of humor. However, both men proved unequal in stature, the mother made Champaklau replace Satyendra on the left side. Now the arrangement was just and perfect and Champaklau had his aspiration fulfilled. His was the last support Sri Aurobindo was to give up. For, as his steps gained in strength and defirmness, he used a stick in the right hand, and Champaklal on the left. Finally he too was dropped. As soon as it came to be known that the master was using a walking stick, several were presented to him and there was one even of tea wood from Assam. Thus every day after the noon and night meals the mother would come to his room and present the stick, and he would walk about for half an hour in her presence. While waiting for the mother's arrival, he would practice various bending exercises for the knee which had been improvised by Dr. Manilo. He did them sitting on the edge of the bed. He actively obeyed whatever was demanded of him. One of the exercises was hanging of the leg, which later became a common joke amongst us. It was not an unreasonable fear that the slightest inattention in walking on his part might upset his balance and cause a fall. He had to walk with his head bent, looking at the ground, and had to be very careful, particularly at turnings, by checking his speed. We were posted at these turnings to prevent any possibility of a mishap. His steps were now not like those of Zeus on Mount Olympus. They had naturally lost that resounding force we were accustomed to hear, when he used to pace up and down above, during our meditation in the hall below. He told us that it was during those walks that he used to bring down the highest force. As the walking progressed with of his former strength, we expected a return to his godlike steps. The days were getting hotter and he used to perspire profusely. 
there was no ceiling fan. We started fanning him as he walked, but what were two small hand fans, the wing wafts of tiny birds in the sultry heat of the closed room? Sri Aurobindo did not seem to be concerned at all, though we were. Purani hit upon a brilliant idea. He came up with a huge palm leaf fan festooned with a red cloth border, as used for the temple deities. The mother smiled approvingly. Stationed near the door, he began fanning with all the vigor of his bare muscular arms and a miniature storm would sweep by. We enjoyed the grand sight. It was so becoming to his giant's nature. He handled it very well. Once for some days he could not come up, and the fan lay idle, like the mythical bow in the cave. With much trepidation I took it up, a pygmy to the giant, but seeing no question on the mother's face, I set to work. The performance was not bad. I felt rather proud, but alas, pride had its quick fall. By same faux pas, or should I say force main, one day I struck Sri Aurobindo's back with the fan, as he was just turning my corner. He immediately looked around with an indulgent smile, and the mother smiled graciously to lift me up from the crushing shame. But fortunately for the guru and the disciple, it was not repeated. Afterwards both Siachim Paklal and Mulshanka used the fan with a greater skill. When at the end of the walk he would stand in the middle of the room with the stick in his right hand, his upright figure with the flowing beard on his broad bare chest, his two plaits of silken hair in front, and a faraway look in his calm wide open eyes, he would kindle a soft glow of love and adoration in our hearts. The mother would then take the stick from him, after an exchange of sweet smiles between them, she would go away. Champaklal would then step in and wipe away the dripping perspiration. Then he would sit in the chair and sponging of the divine body would begin. This practice was continued for several years till a bathroom was built nearby. Our complaint about this crude mode of cleansing was received with a disarming serenity. Neither one arrangement nor another made the slightest difference to his composure. He did not seem to be living in the body at all, or he left it completely into the mother's care. Along with the sponging the talks would start, Purani from behind, I from the front, Dr. Manilal sitting on one side and Sachindra standing on the other. We all took part in the talk and worked at the same time. And Sri Aurobindo, perhaps melting by the touch of hot water, would release his silence into a many-hued speech. Sometimes Purani hurled a question from behind, Satyendra took it up, then I answered, and so the question went round with Sri Aurobindo sitting at the centre, listening quietly, answering, or to our delight, springing a surprise by a sudden joke. At times he sat still, leaning against the chair with two fingers of his right hand on his lips, as if musing on something. After a while he would relax and the talk would follow. Once. In the midst of our engrossed talk, there was a mild tap at the door. Sri Aurobindo looked at us, and we wondered who could be violating the privacy. Another tap, and the door was opened by one of us, to our surprise it was the mother who came with a piece of paper in her hand and said, for Sri Aurobindo. It was some important war news that had just been relayed over the radio. This little incident is a pointer to the Mother S and Sri Aurobindo's vital interest in the war. The last thing to be done was the bending of the knee. As I have mentioned, there was an exercise called hanging the leg. Manilal S approaching visit for the Dushan would make Sri Aurobindo utter, Oh, Manilal is coming, I must hang my leg, or when Manilal would inquire from Baroda about it, he would reply with a smile, It is still hanging. The bending exercise was apparently an ineffectual one, but Sri Aurobindo persisted and we too encouraged him as if he were a little child. At any rate the result was not proportionate to the effort. Dr. Ayo who was very happy to see the master at last free from the tyrannical shackles of the splints took the opportunity, whenever he came, of massaging his leg. May I do it, sir? He would ask and would never forget to praise Sri Aurobindo as an ideal patient. Another imposition placed on him by the doctor was that in order to tone up his body he had to do some freehand exercises. Every morning while still in bed, he would, without fail, 
practiced them vigorously, the flex ion and extension of his arms and the raising and lowering of H's legs. Sometimes the arms overcome by sleep would sink into feeble, mechanical movements and then would wake up with a start to resume their duty. The summer heat or an uncomfortable position in bed could not persuade him to break the rule. When I entered the room for my morning work, this assiduous application would greet my eyes. His leg would rise and fall like a hammer, and I could not contain my feeling of amusement and admiration at this hard to pleasure to achieve the supramental perfection of the body. Perhaps this semi-blasphemy has come upon me like a boomerang, now making me undergo physical to pleasure even at this age. It cannot be denied, anyway, that Sri Aurobindo was not meant for such hard and rough gymnastics. There are some things which cannot be conceived of, for instance Tagore or Dilip courting jail. During the non-cooperation movement Manilal's prescription did some good all the same, for the soft and mellow frame got a firm nervous tone and the muscles developed fine contours, to his great satisfaction. Perfection is the supramental keyword. Any imperfection, however slight, was foreign to Sri Aurobindo as nature. I give a minor example. One day, while talking about snoring, one of us was tactless enough to tell him that he too had the habit. It must have been an awkward side effect of the accident due to a malposition of the body. But it came to him as a great surprise. And I was astonished to mark that from the very next day the physiological aberration stopped for good. Even while correcting our poems, he would always do it perfectly. If he was pressed for time, he would ask the poem back and make it flawless. Any perfection achieved in any field by him was a cosmic conquest. One man's perfection still can save the world. Dr. Manila advised us to massage Sri Aurobindo's body too, particularly the lower part. Early morning was thought by common consent to be the most suitable time for it. Three of us would massage him part by part, as he lay in bed and we would go on talking at the same time. To some of our queries he would often answer perhaps, perhaps. Much amused, we asked him one day, why don't you say yes or no, instead of this uncertain perhaps? Because, he replied, the supermind alone has the certainty. We all laughed. Thus we were merrily massaging him and chatting away without ever considering his comfort or discomfort. After quite a few days' torture at our hands he asked me one day most gently, is the massage really necessary? You see, this is the only time when I have some sleep. I replied somewhat guiltily, we shall stop it, it is not necessary. He could have easily dropped it earlier, but the doctor had to be obeyed. Thanks to all these arduous and assiduous exercises, the limb gained in solid strength, and the body its requisite tone. He began now to read the daily papers himself. One day as I was passing a rapid glance over the morning paper, assuming that he was not yet ready, he inquired, the paper hasn't come. I promptly handed it over to him. Have you digested the news? He asked. I smiled abashed. Quiet casual humor, characteristic of Shri. Aurobindo. We reached the month of April. Sri Aurobindo's rapid progress became widely known and people began to clamor for a Dushan, they had already missed two of them, and for the next one in August it would be too painfully long to wait. The mother also began to plead on behalf of the boxers, though not much pleading was needed. For we know that when the mother's heart had melted, the fathers would not take long to do so. Besides, the mother probably wanted Sri Aurobindo to take up his regular activities as soon as possible. Even for him she would not make any exception. Her dynamic nature cannot brook too long an ease. April 24 was then fixed for the Dushan, as it was the day of the mother's final arrival in Pondicherry. Thenceforth the April Dushan became a permanent feature. The date well suited the professors and students, since it fell within the span of the summer holidays. But the Dushan time had to be changed from the morning to the afternoon and it would be a Dushan in the true sense of the word. For the devotees would simply come and stand for a brief while before the mother and the master have their Dushan and quietly leave. 
Sri Aurobindo Ters Ely remarked, no more of that long seven-hour dushan. Formerly the dushan was observed with a great ceremonial pomp. Starting at about 7.30 a.m., it ran with one breathing interval, up to 3 p.m. The devotees offered their garlands and flowers, did two, even three or four pranams to the mother and the master who remained glued to one place throughout the ordeal, and endured another martyrdom under this excessive display of bhakti even as Raman Maharshi suffered from the plague of prasads. Now, all that was cut down at one stroke by the force of external circumstances, and all expression transformed into a quiet inner adoration which is a characteristic of this yoga. Sri Aurobindo's accident made the ceremonial dushan a thing of past history. On the eve of the dushan, the mother washed Sri Aurobindo's hair with our help. It was such an elaborate and complicated affair that had it been left in our hands, it would have ended in confusion, particularly because it had to be done in the bedroom. Hot and cold water, basins, soap, powder, etc., etc., had to be kept ready. What a ceremony really, this washing was. No wonder ladies go in for bob or shingle. Formerly, Sri Aurobindo, it seems, used to wash his long hair every night, but I am sure he did without all all this paraphernalia. His secluded life had, of course, simplified the whole complex process. Later on when a bathroom adjoining his living room was built, washing lost its formidable character. Sri Aurobindo bore all this torture as a part of the game, I suppose. The Dushan day at last. In the morning, the mother arrived in his room with a flower, probably a red lotus, knelt before the Lord, placed the lotus on his bed and bowed down to receive his blessings and his sweet smile. This was the second time I saw her doing pranam to him. The first time was on her birthday, February the 21st. It was a revelation to me, for I did not expect her to bow down in the Indian way. On every Dushan day since then I enjoyed the sight. On other days she used to take his hand and lightly kiss it. With her customary drive, she chalked out the Dushan program, the time for Sri Aurobindo's luncheon of her coming for the Dushan. We had to be ready and keep the master ready too. From the early morning time began to move fast, the mother was seen rushing about, she had so many things to attend to. Everything finished, clad in a lovely sari, a crown adorning her shapely head, looking like a veritable goddess, she entered Sri Aurobindo's room with brisk steps, earlier than the appointed time, as was her wont. She gave a quick glance at us. We were all attention. The entire group was present, it being the first dushan after the accident. She was pleased to find us ready. Sri Aurobindo was dressed in an immaculate white dhoti, its border daintily creased, as is the custom in Bengal, a silk chadar across his chest and his long shining hair flowing down a picture that reminded us of Shiva and Shakti going out to give dushan to their boktas, Sri Aurobindo was in front and the mother behind. They sat together as on other dushan days, she on his right, a glorious view, and the ceremony began. It was, however, a simple dushan. One by one the sardak stood for a brief moment before the one in two, and passed on quietly thrilled and exalted by their silent look and gracious smile. The feelings of the sardaks can be imagined when they saw their beloved master restored to his normal health. The dushan was over within an hour, and when Sri Aurobindo was back in his room Dr. Ayo remarked in his childlike manner, Sir, you looked grand at the dushan. Sri Aurobindo smiled and we retorted, just to tease him, at other times he doesn't. I.O., nonplussed, replied, no, no, I did not mean that. Truly, I.O. had expressed the sentiments of hundreds of devotees who had a glimpse of him during the Dushan. What a grandeur and majesty in his simple silent pose. What a power, as if he held the whole world in the palm of his hand. If ever a human being could attain the stature of a god, he was there for all to see and be blessed by. Many have had a deep change after just one touch of his godlike magnificence. A touch can alter the fixed front of fate. 
Many had visions and boons they had long been seeking for, and for the Sardaks each Dushan was a step to a further milestone towards the Eternal. Sri Aurobindo had said, Dushans are periods of great descents. It was not for nothing that Hitler chose the 15th of August for his royal ascension in Buckingham Palace and got the first heavy blow. Nor was it for nothing that India gained her independence on that immortal day. Now that Sri Aurobindo was physically all right, the mother must find some work for him too. Most opportunely came a demand from the Arya Publishing House, Calcutta, for a book from Sri Aurobindo, preferably The Life Divine. The work had appeared long ago in the Arya and it could now be published in book form. The mother caught hold of the idea and asked for his approval. Sri Aurobindo wanted to write one or two new chapters. So he set to work. A new writing table was made and placed in front of him across his bed, provided with three pens, two pencils and paper. For me it was a moment of great curiosity to see him at work. We had heard so much about the silent mind through which ideas, leaping down from above, passed directly into the pen, that I thought I could now put it to the test, as if one could see the silent mind as well as the invisible ideas descending one by one from above the ranges of the mind. At least I could see how he wrote. Was it at all like us, human beings, scrapping, stopping, thinking? There he was, then, sitting on the bed, with his right leg stretched out. I was watching his movements from behind the bed. No sooner had he begun than followed line after line as if everything was chalked out in the mind, or as he used to say, a tap was turned on and a stream poured down. Absorbed in perfect poise, gazing now and then in front, wiping the perspiration off the hands, for he perspired profusely, he would go on for about two hours. The mother would drop in with a glass of coconut water. Sometimes she had to wait for quite a while before he was aware of her presence. Then exclaiming ah, he took the glass from the loving hand, drank it slowly, and then plunged back into his work. It was a very sweet vision, indeed, the mother standing quietly by his side with a smile and watching him, and he forgetful of everything, writing away, then a short exchange of beatific glances. At the end of the writing, the place where he sat he would be completely drenched, there was so much perspiration in the summer months but remarkably free from any odor. We used to wipe his body and change the bed sheets. But what shocked me most was when finishing the first chapter, he asked us to tear it and throw it into the waste paper basket. It needed rewriting. I was very much tempted to keep it intact, but that would be a violation of his order. Champa Clow told me that he kept some of the torn pieces as a souvenir. I noticed what a fine calligraphy it was with hardly a scratch, almost without a scar or wound. Not at all like his correspondence handwriting which he himself could not decipher sometimes. We have cut many jokes with him about his handwriting. Once I wrote, Sir, will you take the trouble to mark those portions of your letter that can be shown to others? He replied, Good Lord, Sir, I can't do that you forget that I will have to try to read my own hieroglyphs. I have no time for such an exercise. I leave it for others. I do not know if all great men write in this spotless and spontaneous manner. It seems he wrote all his seven volumes of the Arya directly on the typewriter. How I wished I could one day write at this aeroplanic speed, to use Sri Aurobindo's own expression. However the writing of Savitri was quite a different story. There he had to labor, change, chisel, omit, revise, all this, of course, from a silent mind. Only a few poems like Rose of God and A God's Labor just came down Ian Block and not a word was changed. The mother must have been very pleased to see him resume his activity after the passage through the long dark night. With the improvement of his health, he began to spend some hours sitting in a chair and devoting his entire time to spiritual intellectual and decreative activities. The accident had released him in a drastic manner from the eight or nine hours labor of correspondence. He could now take up the revision of all his major works, one after another. The first to see the light of day was the 
first volume of his magnum opus, The Life Divine. It was the end of 1939, the year of World War II. The publication of the aria of which the divine life was the basic theme, started in 1914, the year of World War I. Can we call these mere coincidences? The two other volumes came out on the heels of the first one and were extensively rewritten. He composed many sonnets also. We used to see his pen indefatigably writing away page after page. We could not know what was being written, because, except for the sonnets, he passed everything to the mother. She received it as a gift from God and sent it on to Preeth We Sing for typing. Though his eyesight was bad, his typing was so neat and clean, done with such minute care, that Sri Aurobindo was very pleased with his work. So long as Sri Aurobindo could use his own eyes, we had no direct means of knowing what he was about. Of course, we could sometimes overhear or he would himself tell us about the topics, how far he had come, if something new he had added, etc. Pirani and Satyendra were interested in the life divine, and the former would try to fish for some information regarding it. Sometimes fate or chance or even necessity helped us in knowing what the master was doing. Srinivasalinga sent his manuscript of Sri Aurobindo's life for his perusal. Sri Aurobindo began to add to it a substantial portion about his political life of which none had any authentic knowledge. He was in the habit of using a small pad called block manufactured in France and meant for writing short letters or notes. But as he used it for the former purpose, many sheets were needed. He tore them out of the block and tried to pin them together, but because of their bulk, he failed to do it. Neither would he call for our assistance, he would go on fumbling. We would enjoy the scene from a distance till Champaclau, unable to restrain himself, would rush up and take the awkward business away from him. Thenceforth, recognizing his limitations, perhaps, he waited for Champaclau to do the job. Nalini who knew Sri Aurobindo's ways from his early days, instructed us not to leave all these slight material vexations to him. But how to spare him unless he himself called, was the point. One had to be bold and open. The publication of the first volume of The Life Divine was a great event and was hailed with delight. From all lips was heard a jubilant chanting, The Life Divine is out, the Life Divine is out. Dara one composed some light verses to celebrate the event. Sri Aurobindo, informed about it, asked, what sort of a poem? Life divine. Full of wine. Purani answered, yes, you have caught it. It goes, life divine. Mother's wine. The book is out let us shout. There was a rush to buy the book and get Sri Aurobindo's autograph in the bargain. For a divine policy was announced, whose brainwave it was, I do not know that all buyers would be favoured with the autograph of the master. Volume after volume began to pour in with the names of the buyers appended to them. The names were sometimes quite long, such as Purushottamdas the Kurdas Chintamoni Potil, and he would ask, am I to write all that? And there were fanciful spellings to boot. Dates as well. At times the names of the husband and his wife together. If sometimes a name struck his fancy he would ask, who the devil is he? Or who is this Lord Shiva? Or we, would ourselves say that he was so and so? Many were the boctors who could not understand a word of the book but bought it for the sake of his blessings. For our sardaks who could not afford to buy it, the book was given free on our birthday, with the autograph added to it. Later all the books of the mother and Sri Aurobindo when published, were given to us according to our needs, on our birthdays. The mother would ask, do you want any book? Have you got this book? One wonders how much money was spent on this, and the custom continues even now, though in a modified form. When volume 3 came out, it being the bulkiest, Sri Aurobindo remarked, what a fat elephant. And when they entered the room in packs and were heaped on the side couch waiting for the autograph, they made an impressive. Heard and thrilled us with joy that the life divine had at last been delivered on this woe-begone planet of ours. But with the encroaching dimness of his eyesight, 
the mother stopped the practice of giving autographs altogether. Another significant event that was shaping itself in 1939 was the political situation in Europe. Hitler's barking for Lebensraum had been reverberating throughout the continent for some years and the war clouds seemed to be gathering. Sri Aurobindo was watching the situation closely. In 1938 the war was almost imminent. Sri Aurobindo told us that for many reasons war was not favoured at that time, and it did get stopped, as Sri Aurobindo wished. We used to hold daily discussions on the fate of the nations, of India and other dark consequences that would follow in the wake of Hitler's mad ambition. Chamberlain's peace mission failed and within a year of Sri Aurobindo's accident, the war broke out. We came to learn from him that England had at last declared war on Germany. He had learnt it from the mother who had got the news from Pavitra. There was then no radio in the ashram. We shall deal further with the topic of war in a separate chapter. These are the highlights of the first year following the accident. Sri Aurobindo's leg had now become quite strong, he could walk without any support. When at the end of the year 1939, Dr. Manila asked Sri Aurobindo if the accident had done any good, he replied, Yes, I have advanced much further since last November. I have found time to complete some books. Now I get more time to concentrate. Owing to the accident, the mother's program also had changed a LOT. She had had to suspend all pranams and personal interviews with the Sardaks. But now they were resumed, though in a different form. Old things as they used to be never come back. I remarked before the mother one day, now that Sri Aurobindo is all right we shall soon be packed off. She heard and gave a broad smile. The year 1940 found us, on the contrary, firmly established in Sri Aurobindo's service. He could not dispense with his old medical team. Life had now taken a definite pattern and ran, with minor variations, a regular course and our duties were fixed. The years that followed brought him closer. And closer to us at first, then took him farther away at the end. The interlude will have as its theme the divine event that had unrolled during the twelve years of our stay with the supreme actor. I shall begin with his external life. The House of the Lord. We were thus installed in the house for an indefinite period. This was the house in which Sri Aurobindo and the mother lived for about a decade before we broke into their seclusion. Sri Aurobindo had not gone one step out of this house, nor seen any visitors or inmates, only Champaklau, his personal attendant, had glimpses of him. He used to find his body shining like gold. Our work too was to serve the Lord as is done in the temple, not as medical attendants, for henceforth he needed none, but to minister to his physical and other minor needs, to be near him, even to amuse him by our talk and presence. That was our yoga. What better way could there be than to serve personally the Guru, the Divine? Sri Ramon Krishna had said to his nephew Raidi, Serve me and you will get all you want. We had no particular want till then and all our heart was offered to him in utter dedication. It is gratifying for us to remember that Sri Aurobindo had said in tea he beginning that he was happy to have such a team to serve him. Service was our life, and the hours passed with a moon-imprinted sail. Sri Aurobindo did not require, in fact, so many hands, since he had almost recovered the use of his own limbs but it was not Sri Aurobindo's or the mother's way to dispense with someone, even something, as soon as their need of him was over. Their grace would always be with him. How did we serve him? The best way to give a clear idea about it would be to present a picture of Sri Aurobindo's daily life, now that it had fallen into a definite pattern and woven our activities into it. However, I fear that in depicting his external life, some misconception may be created in the minds of the readers about his real self. Since man is usually led by surface appearance and expressions, we are likely to be taken up by his outward gestures or words and have not the least idea of the vast consciousness from which these movements flowed. For instance, when he talked to us as a friend, could we ever have imagined that he was the divine talking to us as divine beings? 
When he saw Dr. Manilo, could Manilo have perceived that it was no longer Dr. Manilo but the divine living in the divine that he saw? How could we guess that living confined within the body and the small room, he saw Paris, Tokyo and New York? He could say, my soul unhorizoned widens to measureless sight. Referring to a certain context I once told him, I am satisfied with you as Sri Aurobindo pure and simple. He replied, no objection, I only suggested that I don't know who this Sri Aurobindo pure and simple is. If you do, I congratulate you. Far be it from me to read his inner consciousness from his outer activities. Once I asked him to tell me the names of those who were enjoying the Brahmic consciousness so that I could have a practical knowledge of it. He replied, how can you have a practical knowledge of it by knowing who is it? You might just as well expect to have a practical knowledge of high mathematics by knowing that Einstein is a great mathematician. His written works leave us in no doubt about the heights of consciousness to which he soared, the depths he has explored and his constant status of consciousness. But how they would influence, affect his daily human activities is a question of perennial interest. Did not Arjuna pose that question to Sri Krishna? The activities themselves may not shed any light on his inner divinity, especially to a superficial gaze. Still, the truly great touch everything G they do and say with a sense of greatness. Hence, my attempt to make a selective sketch of Sri Aurobindo's outer life for the world I to have a glimpse of the riddle that he was throughout his earthly existence. Many fantastic tales were abroad about his outer life, gaining ground and credit because of his living in seclusion. Some people believed that he neither ate nor slept, but remained absorbed in samadhi. Others had heard that he could keep his body suspended in the air. Some there were who, like Arjuna, wanted genuinely to know how he spoke, how he sat and walked. The mother had, at one time, discouraged us from dwelling upon these external aspects for fear that people's minds would be deflected from the reality. After all it is not what a man appears to be which is most important. And we can affirm that all Sri Aurobindo's actions welled from the divine consciousness that he embodied, they were yukta karma. But how to demonstrate this? By having a practical knowledge of his day-to-day -day activity? Well, he who sees, sees. Let us then begin from the very break of day. The sun's rays came in by the eastern window, he was awake and the exercises started in bed, prescribed by Manilal. By 6.30 a.m. He sat up to receive the mother who on her way to the balcony Dushan visited him to have his Dushan. Sri Aurobindo gave us definite instructions to wake him up before the mother's arrival. On the other hand, the mother wanted us not to disturb his sleep. So at times we found ourselves in a quandary. Champa Klal's devotional nature would not interrupt his sweet nap after the exercises, while I, when alone, would try by all sorts of devices to wake him up. Sometimes he himself would wake up only to learn that the mother had come and gone. Then she would come back after the dushan and begin her day with his blessings, just as we did after her dushan. This was followed by his reading the Hindu. Between 9 o'clock a.m. and 10 o'clock a.m. the mother came to comb his hair, apply a lotion and plait it. Most often she finished some business during this period. When a sadak translated the mother's prayers and meditations into English and wanted her approval, she had it read out before Sri Aurobindo and both of them made the necessary changes. She sometimes talked of private matters, and when her voice sank low, we took the hint and withdrew discreetly. She believed more in subtle methods than in open expressions. The gesture, the look, the smile, the fugitive glance, the silence, a thousand are her ways of communication to the soul. After the mother had left, there started the routine of washing the face and mouth. Here a small detail calls for mention by its unusualness. When he had finished using neem paste for his teeth and the mouthwash, vadimikam, he massaged his gums with a little bit of oriental balm. 